Yeah, so today we're actually talking about design and research. So researching for production design. So that actually goes into what you were talking about anyway, um, Gabe. You're talking about the thing yeah, you're gonna awesome. do in the 70s. It's, you know, obviously it's gonna take some research to really find what people were wearing and what they what they looked like, what kind of makeup they wore and stuff like that. So right. um, with production design, no matter if it's modern day or if it's set in some time period, especially if it's set in a time period, there's gonna be some amount of research that needs to be done most likely. So it's like, what kind of, um, what kind of clothes did the people wear? What kind of hairstyles and makeup did they have in that area at that time? And that's gonna be different for whatever area and time period you, you look at. It's going to be different styles, different fashion, different makeup. Yeah, I would recommend because like, just because it took place in the 70s does not mean the 70s looks the same for every city, every state, every country. The 70s right. in Brazil, for example, looked very different than the 70s in the US. So those, you know, are different. So, yeah, things. it matters about time and region, um, as well as, you know, other things, of course, like beyond that, what was their class system and of your characters, what are they gonna be? So, um, you know, was there a class system in that area at that time period? Most likely, yes. Yeah. Did they dress differently? Did they act differently? Did they pronounce things differently? That's all stuff that like production designers and the other parts of the filmmakers will be looking into. But like the higher class, they always have a different talk. style, a different way to walk, a different way to, um, you know, canes, things like that, top hats, stuff like that, that you would have to look into and, and see in certain areas. Whereas in the same time period, a lower class uh, would wear a different style or different hat style. Or, and if that, and then if you look at American history, uh, it's even more varied because it depends on where did that person come from originally and do their parents still in still. Like yeah, if they have money, if off. they don't. Um, I would also say that how you speak is very um, different. It can be, depending on what kind of movie you're making, it can be very jarring to have like a movie from, especially the 70s, like older time, older period films, people sometimes suspend their disbelief if they talk a little different or change a few things. But if you have expressions, ways of speaking that completely have or co completely different than the time period you're doing or that weren't even around or didn't even mean the same thing around the time that you're portraying, that can really um, kind of shatter the illusion, I would say. So, so that's another thing to keep in mind as well. Well, yeah, and that's more on the side of um, the director, the screenwriter and that type of thing to get those things right the producers as well. Whereas uh, for production designers, that we're just looking at the visual elements. Like no, I know, I just forgot to touch that when we were talking about that kind of thing, so I remembered. Okay. Yeah. But yeah, so it's uh, like, what, what did they wear? What kind of makeup did they have? What was their hairstyles like? What was the class system? Did they wear different things? Did they act differently? Were they in different structured areas at the time in that area? What did the buildings look like? You know, were they stone? Were they brick? Were they very rectangular, square, round? There's so many different things depending on. Oh yeah, architecture is huge as well because if you're shooting in the neighborhood and you have architecture that looks very much like a period, like a period that hasn't happened yet, then that can really take you off as well. Right. Mm -hmm. That was and even in like mm -hmm. Priscilla like this one. Oh, sorry. Uh, what were you saying? <laughs> yeah, because I was thinking, you know, the we lived in a a building in Brooklyn, and it, it would be like those type of buildings, you know, would be they 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 all have a certain look. You always you know you in Brooklyn. Mm -hmm. Like exactly. The, with, with the yeah, the structure of those. Yeah, um, sometimes buildings. it can be so specific to where you, because that's the specific look of that area. You, you, um, do, you can just look at it and know. Okay, that's where it is. Priscilla, can you recognize this place? Yes, honey. You took you took a bunch of you found a bunch of pictures <laughs> of Brasilia. <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah, and so like it depends on where you're at, what time period and stuff like that, what the buildings would look like and if they look futuristic or not. And even when um, a production designer is making something that isn't real, they're usually drawing on sources that are from real so, things. So, so this futuristic be... buildings, they might take inspiration from stuff like this because it does look pretty futuristic for, you know, the time and this is actually real like it's in brazil this is so. the this is the capital of brazil and it was actually completely designed to fit together and they were all designed well not all of brasilia but most of brasilia the basic architecture was designed by one architect and he took a lot of inspiration from futuristic but also he believed himself to be the reincarnation of a pharaoh so he also used a lot of um interesting Yes, <laughs> he also used a lot of, it was a mix between modern architecture and old a Aztec um, Egyptian architecture as well. For example, that one, right, uh, that theater right down there, you can see that it looks very futuristic, but it also has somewhat of a pyramid look to it. Yeah. And, On the bottom right. Yeah. So yeah, when you're doing production design, it's the same thing. It's just you are drawing on real inspiration or ideas of something to create something that's similar but has your own design to it. Oh, I got you. What are these different buildings out there? What was that? Yeah. Huh? What are the different buildings there? Oh, oh uh, that is the uh, uh, Yeah, so the one up top looks very much like Top left or in, right? Oh, sorry. The one in the top, uh, I don't know why, guys, but in, in English, I just forget left and right sometimes. I'm sorry. So the one in the top left looks very much, um, I think that's the Palacio de Planalt. I could, yeah, it is. Okay, so it's kind of like our White House. Mm. So there's, um, there's a difference. Like some of these are where the senators are. Some of these are uh, where the president would be where the Supreme Justices are mainly. Um, some of these are theaters. And in Niteroi, we have one that looks very much like that one in the top left as well, but it's just a round dome. It's like a huge dome and it's an art museum. Oh, I see. But yeah, so depending on what, where you are and what time period you are looking at, you'll want to draw, you'll, you or your production designer, pretty much everyone actually, but. Uh, everyone involved with the creative look of the film will want to have inspiration and um, draw inspiration from these places, especially if you're oh. making it set in a time period that is in a certain location and you're going for accuracy. You definitely want to do your research to try to accurately portray that as best as possible. Because, you know, oh. some of the buildings, if you look in the past, some of the buildings aren't going to be around anymore. A good example. And the styles be... and design. So you have to like remake them to uh, make it look like what you're going how, to do. How easy is example... it to film in this area? Oh, in Brasilia? I, honestly, I don't know. I know a few movies that um, you have a license to film there. And in Brazil, there is like a government thing where um, if it is for um, to get more people to visit the place to help with uh what's the word i'm looking for honey um permits no no people that when you visit somewhere gosh the words today are just disappearing from Travel? my brain you know. no um when they incentivize gosh what is it subsidy what sorry subsidies no i don't remember but anyway <laughs> basically <laughs> They will have programs that you can apply for that's like, we want to make a film um, here, or we want to film a music video here, or we want to have a concert here. And they were like, oh, if it's going to help people see our country more, if it's going to help people want to visit this place more, then you can make a deal with them. And there's like a whole program. Tourism? And stuff. Tourism, yes, that was the word I was looking for. Gosh. Okay. All right. And it sounds similar <laughs> <that>. too. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, what the heck? Why are we yeah. <laughs> But the thing with Brasilia, the thing that's complicated is the center of it was very much designed. Like if you have an aerial shot, it's, it's like perfectly designed to have all of those, um, a lot of those government buildings together. So filming there is probably, I would imagine, I I'm not an expert, but I would imagine kind of very risky and very hard to do because 
a lot of those government buildings are together. And, right. you know, that safety risk and all that kind of thing. Right. And so that's why you might draw inspiration from it, but then recreate it either using a miniature or a set to or there are mimic other... the different buildings or just get draw inspiration from it and then create your own design out of it. Or there are other cities uh, or other buildings in Brazil that are, were also built by Oscar Niemeyer. So you can also go there and see if they're similar enough. And although honestly, they're so specific and so different that it's, yeah, you'd have to recreate it or you'd have to like get found footage because they are very unique that I know of. I don't know a lot about international architecture, but I know that they are very unique for, for us. He had like his own little touch with everything. But, but yeah, um, I would say that a good example of that is for example, let's say movies that show the Golden Gate Bridge a lot. And it does somewhat look like a basic bridge, so to speak, but it is also very recognizable because of the skyline, because of the surroundings. So you can't just get a, a bridge that looks, oh, it looks somewhat like it and do it. I mean, you can, but you have to make sure that you have like the background, if you're using green screen or if you're using found footage to try to make it as realistic as possible because it's such a big landmark that when people see it, they're gonna be like, oh, are they, like, I don't know if you guys watch a, watch a lot of 2000s movies and they would do, some would do the Golden Gate Bridge and some, but am I thinking correctly, is it called the one in San Francisco? Is that the Golden Gate or am I thinking of New York? I don't know, um, but my brain today is mush. But basically, San Francisco is San Francisco is Golden Gate Bridge. Okay, good. I'm just making sure I'm not saying something stupid. Um, e easy to remember is the Gold Rush. So Gold Rush was uh, in uh, the West. So Golden Gate yeah. is basically a Gold Rush. It's just sometimes you ah, know when you, when you're trying to remember things, your brain will like turn to mush and you'll sound like an idiot, say things that <laughs> yeah. Um, but basically. Um, the thing is, a lot of, in the, a lot of movies, they would do that, but smaller movies, sometimes they were like, oh, we don't need necessarily that one, right? We can get a bridge that looks like it. And you could definitely tell in like those older movies, it's like, are they trying to do the San Francisco uh, bridge, but they couldn't get it? Because that bridge looks a lot like it, but not really. Or something like that. Or they would try to like imitate the ferries in San Francisco, you know, those big buses um, and stuff like that. It's like, okay, it, that's that's a feel of it. It's not just small movies. It's, it's big Hollywood. They do it too. Yeah. Um, like one of the, the transform. I think it was Transformers 2. No, the third one, I believe. Um, they The one that was in D.C., um, they filmed in D.C. and like all the people that are from the area were like, man, this is bogus because <laughs> um, they filmed a scene in, I think it was in San Francisco, but they tried to play it off like it was D.C. But <laughs> the building, the buildings were too tall. Um, D.C. has a code like no building can be taller than um, I think it's the memorial or something like that. No building can be taller than that. So if you come to DC, there is no building that's taller than that. Yeah, because it's a building, safety requirement. Build, I don't know. It's some code or something like that. I, I think it's just a thing they don't want people, you know, they don't want any, because, you know, it you also, can go. It also might be for sniper protection, you know, so no one can go in a building and try to. No, not because New York has like the tallest buildings in the world. But um, no, it's, it's for because certain monuments are like cherished so much i guess it's kind of seen like a the city is kind of like a big oh to protect the skyline no it's not even to protect the skyline it's it's just stop for guessing <laughs> yeah, okay. Stop <laughs> guessing. okay geez okay <laughs> it's just that so if you go to dc like you can photograph the mon you so you there's the, the monument the capitol and the white house are all lined up uh, mm -hmm. in a row so it's like you can go in on almost any angle in dc and get photo aerial photographs so it is different with the skyline coda with the not necessarily an aerial thing but it's more of a, for photographic purposes yeah. and stuff like that well preserving the skyline isn't much aerial as it is just like oh our architecture our design blah, 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 blah. yeah so you know everybody was in, everybody that, that lives in dc knows this the only buildings that are tall are the ones that are in Arlington and in, in Maryland and stuff like they have the tall buildings. 
So like, you know, everybody's, oh, this can't, this isn't DC. They used to do that in the 90s too, where they would try to uh-huh. do um, a film. I think the only film I've seen that did a good job representing DC was the, the movie Salt. I know, uh, who was it? Arnold Schwarzenegger did a movie and it was Bruce, Bruce Willis did a movie where they were trying to be in DC. And I was like, that's not what the, they did a subway scene. And I was like, that's not what, you know, Arnold Schwarzenegger, uh, True Lies was in DC too, but they mm. did a good job. They did a good job. They actually shot at um, the Georgetown Mall and, and it was actually at the Georgetown Mall and stuff like that. So I was like, okay. But a lot of times they'll they'll try to represent something and it's just like, oh, that's, if you live in DC, you know that's not, <laughs> that's not real. Right. And so like with production design, they definitely have to look at, even modern day, you should look at uh, your production designer or if you are the production designer. I've heard White House the different. Movies. I've heard a lot of movies that have the White House get a lot of stuff really wrong. Movies, TV shows, to, yeah. like, like, it, ridiculously wrong. If, and the thing is, the White House itself isn't even, you know, people think, oh, it's the president, it's, you know, but it's more of a tourist attraction than anything else. Like, a lot of that stuff is just, like, the underground secret stuff that you're, you're not supposed to know. But, like, Uh-oh. a lot of people don't realize that... <laughs> You know, people think, oh, it's the White House. The president is there. People don't realize, like, half the time the president isn't even there. And then, like, you'll see, uh, they'll do dummy runs where they'll where they'll send uh, like the, the limos and stuff, and it'll make you think that the president is out and about. No, but, but I'm talking about like around. architecture too, like basic architecture. Um, when I was looking up, um, as far as like production design, they were talking about a few TV shows that are sh- supposed to be shot within the White House or around the White House. One of the ones was the one we were, we were watching, Honey, that we gave up on. Um, and they were talking about the things that it got right and wrong as far as production goes, production design goes. Oh yeah, definitely. The different rooms. Um, a lot of people don't realize that the White House has two sides. There's a front and a back. <laughs> and most people have only seen the front because of what they see on the TV. Like I didn't realize, like I was, you know, um, cause you know, I did the riot stuff when all that stuff was going on and they had us posted in the back. I was like, this is the White House? It's so different. Oh, because we're in the back. The, like, the that's pretty different. part is in the yeah. front. Yeah. The ugly part is in the back. Yeah, people don't realize that because you're, you're only used to seeing the one angle of it. That people don't realize that the back looks like something different. I mean, you could tell it's the White House, but you wouldn't think it's the White House if you looked at the back of it. You're like, a tip oh. that I would give that I just remembered, there's um, a political show um, called the mechanism. I talk about it all the time. It's on Netflix, and it's I'm talking about Brazilian corruption and all this stuff. And there are a few shots. Um, I don't remember like specific shots in my brain because it's been such a long time. But um, where like basically, I'm using this as an example. A good way that you can, if you want to shoot the perspective of you're in either the White House or the Palacio uh, do Planalto or whatever, you can what you can do is you can recreate the window of it maybe. And if you want, and like the interior and the skyline and use either green screen or take photos or, or use um, an aerial, aerial shot. There is a lot of found footage out there right now. And there's a lot of people whose job is it to travel around the world and get that kind of footage to yeah. add to you to films stock, and stuff I, I have a thing against stock footage it's just I me. Mean, everyone because, uses the same ones yeah. it's not even that <laughs> it's that sometimes a lot of times the, per, the person that records the footage is using like this really high resolution camera and then a lot of the lower budget guys aren't using Ooh. the same stuff so it doesn't match up like quality wise like the this, you know they'll start the movie off with like some shots of the white house and they're like, all right this is gonna be good and then they'll get into like the actual <laughs> film and i'm like oh like i got ripped off you know what i that's mean that's true <laughs> i never thought of that it's it, true. it like, irks the it kills me so much like that and the fact that um so like i said a buddy of mine he, he did a feature and um he's now he's got it on bet now it's about to be on bet in july and they were using stock footage, but it was like stock footage of like the White House and the Capitol stuff. And I was like, it really doesn't fit the tone because you're you're showing that like every time they do a, a film in DC, that's like the first thing they show. Oh, the White House, 
you know, like they have to represent that this is, you know, DC. But I was like, you know, there's right. there's other parts to there's it. There's other parts of DC. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that you could show. Like if you're trying to represent, you know, I knew New York has like there's so many landmarks that show this. Hey, this is New York. You know, it's not just the Statue of Liberty. Yeah, <laughs> right. the, or the Empire State Bridge, Building. Yeah. The yeah. Golden Gate Bridge because that's what they could get the. Uh, oh, the Chrysler Building and Spider Man, the the original one. Yeah. Why did I say Golden Gate Bridge again? See, that's what I mean, Vish. I'm telling you, my brain. (laughs) I meant the other bridge. See? I'm telling you, my brain is the Brooklyn Bridge. That's thank you. (laughs) My brain today, man. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. Goodness gracious. My uh, but um it's just when I'm nervous, my brain just goes in there. Oh, but yeah, so I feel like there, that that is such a good point, Brian, because also it makes your film look cheaper, look worse than it actually is if you can tr- have that such a jarring contrast between the two. But yeah. but on the other but on the other end, I have seen people that will film stock footage with a GoPro, with like a less a lesser resolution GoPro as well, because the indie scene is becoming bigger and people are looking for different resolution um different resolution videos and stuff like that when we were researching stock footage and that kind of thing i uh, i saw a different um like it would tell you well filmed on this filmed on that so that you could compare yeah Hmm. i feel like that's really helpful as well yeah all right so um but when it's production design, <laughs> sorry, sorry, I'm... no, we're good. Uh, when it's production design, you just they have to be sure. Like even though we're talking about all of this right now, different cities will have different architecture. They'll have different layouts. They'll have different looking buildings, and you can tell if, especially if you live there. But even people who don't live there who visited different places can tell like when something looks like it's you know Brooklyn or looks like it's. Um, dc or san francisco or some other city because they even though they have similar buildings to an extent oh, they do have yeah. different layouts to where you can tell where you're at based on the time period and the area and so what? that's why the research is so important what is that what's that okay i'm sorry one more pet peeve that i just have to say another thing is like again i'm sorry to, to mention this but like when they're talking about brazil and all they show is the favelas and they think that just a bunch of ugly looking buildings oh yeah that looks like a favela will have like one of the famous murals added to it and it'll look like that part of brazil sure god that hurts me so much it's just one of those things that it's like i know you don't like i know you don't live there and i know that the budget is smaller but put some effort into it because if it doesn't look at all like it or if how many tv shows in the early 2000s used to do have us speaking spanish that is like basic product like production thing right there if you're going to talk about brazilian this brazilian that have them speak portuguese please have when you talk about samba can you please not show someone doing a salsa dance like it's just basic things that most people won't notice i suppose or back then didn't notice but it's just it makes a difference you know i know i know i'm speaking for like the tiny country that not a lot of people know about that the only one of the few in latin america that doesn't speak spanish but it it does make a huge difference and i feel like americans can relate when it's like they're watching other countries make fun of them and that's one thing when it's satirical but if they're taking something serious and they're trying to say something or they're trying to talk about a culture and it just ends up like completely different and completely wrong you know just saying i'm sorry i just had to i just had to touch on that because it's all right again that isn't production design research that's more on the screenwriters and the filmmakers and the producers and no it is partially production design you know why it is for, uh, production design. for the you know dancing what? well it depends on what they wrote in the clothing script. clothing is part of production design isn't yes. it yeah. exactly they get the clothing wrong 
Gotcha. Food. I'm not saying Food you're completely wrong. I'm just saying the stuff you're talking about is more on the lines of filmmaking and screenwriting um, research for the I thing. know, but I'm just saying that those are things that I should have touched on when we were talking about, product, about other stuff as well. And I didn't because I was so focused on getting through the stuff that we needed to get through. And I was like, well, since I'm here and I'm ranting anyway, I might as well finish the rant and uh -huh. I'm done. <laughs> All right. But so yeah, so production designers, they need to make sure that they are, especially if they want people to buy into it and believe that it was either filmed in that location or just to be, um, just to envelop themselves in the story instead of like, that doesn't look like it was from the 17th century or that doesn't look like Japan. Like, what are they doing here? This doesn't look anything like it. They didn't have phone booths and, you know, whatever year. You know, that didn't come until many, many years later. So, you know. You can get away with it if you're doing historical fiction, though. Like Bridgerton, a lot of people were annoyed that it, in the beginning that it wasn't historically accurate. But then they were like, oh, well, this is historical fiction. There's a bunch of stuff that isn't really of the time period or just taking inspiration from that time period. So it also really depends on your story. Yeah, and you might not be going for 100% accuracy, but your production designer should still be doing research to kind of get a idea of that stuff that was around at the time or you know like Bridgerton like what what area what time period does it sort of take place in or does it seem like and then they can draw inspiration from that and then take creative liberties to decide you know okay well we do want a phone booth so I don't care if it wasn't there we're going to put it in but they still need to do the research to kind of like know that that wasn't there and that they are going against the time period, but they're doing it intentionally for the story. Um, and so doing their research and figuring out what the stuff looked like and what people acted like and things like that is really important for production designers to, to do. Also, what kind of vehicles and modes of transport were around at the time in that area? You know, there's different time periods are gonna have different modes of transportation, different looking vehicles, different looking things that do it they're gonna have horses they're gonna have people they're gonna have cars Ooh, that engines, is something that trains. even professional movies get wrong so much and we've seen a lot in cinema sins and stuff like that where they will have oh this song didn't come out until two years after this was filmed or this car wasn't around in in, in this year until like five years after this uh after this time period it released like the little minute details that take you out of it for people that know that are small things but can take you out of the story yeah if you notice if the person notices it and they just uh that'll draw them out of the movie right away um the reason why they use them is typically because if you're doing like 1950s you might not be able to find 20 cars that you need that are all from 1950s so you take one or two that are from 1940s and 1960s and blend them in the background but you know if, there, if someone pauses it and looks they can still point out the things that are wrong hopefully it's not noticeable and that's what the production designer is trying to do is trying to get it as close to it as possible and then of course depending on the budget the logistics and creative um, decisions that are made to make the story flow more than like the accuracy uh, those decisions will be made to then, you know, okay, we can't get 20 cars from this time period. We'll get two that are sort of around this time period and uh, blend them in with the rest and that kind of stuff. Also, what did people's homes on the, what do what the interiors look like? How was it designed on the inside? You know, the outside can look like one thing and the inside of two different places, even now, in, even in the past, now, in the future, if you're doing a future movie, what kind of homes do they have? And uh, what do their interiors look like? You know, And that could depend on what area you're, you're gonna base your story in. Like that's something the production designer, it might not be in the script, but it seems like they are in a place that is very cold. So they might have fireplaces all in their homes and they might have um, very thick walls and things like that so that they can have a lot of more heat in their home because it's very cold outside all the time. And those are the kinds of things that production designers need to research to see like, okay, I feel like these people live in a cold place. They discuss that with the director. Director gives them, yeah, that sounds like 
That's kind of what I'm thinking too. And then um, they then research around different places, like whatever time period they're doing, they research what did people, what did they, what did they look like? What did they, where did they live? And what did they live in um, around that area? Because in the cold areas around that time, because those will look different than the, than the hot areas. If you go to Hawaii, it's going to look different than if you go to um, Alaska, because they're, they're built differently for different reasons. I have a random thing. Sorry. Yeah. I was just thinking, I know your voice was just like, ah. <laughs> <laughs> um, I was just thinking, does anyone else, and this is just me, but I genuinely want to know because this is something that I think about and I wonder if this is just me being like incredibly like overthinker or if this is a thing. When you're watching a show and it's supposed to be summer and the people in the show are wearing like long sleeve shirts and like tight jeans or like, Clothes like that. Does that make you like, oh my gosh, how? Or like two, or is off. it just or is it just my paranoid brain? It's a turn off. It's, it, you know, it's just it's just one of those things that I'm like, isn't it supposed to be summer? How are you not dying right now wearing that? Yeah. And the reason why is because it's probably cold on set, and so the person's wearing a long sleeve, but it's supposed to be summer in the story. And so that it, that also does affect what they should wear and when, because even time periods, we're going back to time periods again, what did they wear in the seasons that we are going to be filming? You know, what winter is going to look different than summer. And then again, it's going to be high class or lower class. Oh, in the Viking class. films, they would wear a lot of fur and higher class would wear a lot of fur, but it was very expensive. So if the person's lower class, they probably wouldn't be able to afford it. Right, and so they would have something else that looks a little more raggedy, but still more layers than they would have in the in the hot months of the year. And so that is a good point to bring up is, you know, the production designer also needs to look at that kind of thing um, and think about that. I so feel like a lot, lot of different shows and movies just ignore that because it's like, oh, well, it's cold on set, so why not? Some people wear long sleeve shirts in summer. I feel like that's something that not a lot of people like, care a lot about. I, uh, I, I kind of agreed with that because, uh, you know, I mean, why do you want to create a confusion whether it's a summer or winter, right? So you dress appropriately and <laughs> that solves the problem. I guess I just always lived in a really hot climate. So every time I'd watch American movies and shows and they'd be wearing long sleeves in summer, I'd be like, is it just yeah. cold in summer too? Like how? <laughs> No, yeah, I mean, it, it, <laughs> I, it was I, cold I on set while they were filming, so they decided to wear a long sleeve shirt, and the, they didn't make them take it off. I, I would think that would be a continuity thing, right? Because uh, you would probably want to keep the season in place through your dresses. Uh, otherwise, you know, you, you kind of confused if if it is a summer and uh, it's very really hot. You know, you're showing the sun, then you're showing. Uh, somebody wearing a t-shirt and uh, sweating that that probably makes more appropriate uh, yeah because we're watching thing, a show right? right now and they're taking off their coat and there's like another coat on them and i'm like oh it's probably winter right like game of thrones you know when you're wearing layers of <laughs> layers of uh, right. <laughs> right yeah and so like it really depends um i think when you do when they have the long sleeve shirts on and like a quote unquote in the summer like in the movie it's supposed to be summer uh, I think it's because it was cold on set. And so they decided, ah, you know what? No one's really going to care. We're going to go ahead and let you wear his long sleeve shirt because maybe the actors of the crew were like, hey, you know, the, they're too cold. They're, they're not going to be able to wear a short sleeve shirt for too long because it's like maybe it's winter while they're filming. Or maybe they're, you know, they're starting to get kind of red looking because they're getting frostbite. So just having a long sleeve shirt or something a little more in between or if it's a good enough camera you can clothing. see the goosebumps i don't know right so like the, I, I think some of that has to do with like logistics and and that kind of thing um on when they decide like whether to go full on into it or not and that's really up to the director and the producers at the end of the day to decide those things the director but if the people are complaining about the logistics of it then the producer might step in and go, I know you want your creative vision to be in the summer and have them have short sleeve shirts, but it's 30 degrees outside. So we're going to put them in long sleeves and we're going to 
put them in coats after every take. So I also like, feel like it depends on how much you're making a point about it being summer. If it's just like, oh, it could be any season or not being very specific, maybe you could get away with it more. Or if it's the beginning of summer, like there are still co some cool days. But if it, you're making a point that it is summer, midsummer or August or whatever, then yeah, then it would be a lot more jarring than if it were just, it might, it's probably summer, early summer, something like that. Yeah. Um, and so production designers have to look into all of this stuff and more like they can also look into what does, you know, maybe there's destruction in the film, a part of the building gets blown open and blown out. And so like it all crumbles around or maybe a tank shot at it. Uh, so what would that look like? What does that building, that specific building look like compared to like a brick building and a wood building, maybe it burned down. Um, and so they should do research into that stuff so they can get some artistic sense of what that looks like, realistically speaking, so that when they're making it, when they're designing it, when they're talking to their set designers and all of that and getting it actually constructed or they're finding a location for it, they can um, paint it and get it looking just like something they saw in a picture or pretty close to where it looks realistic and the people will buy it and not just be like, that doesn't, that looks like a set piece. You don't, you don't, they never want that. You always want your work to go unnoticed. Um, if this was a building that was created, obviously they created it to look like it was destroyed, but they actually created it. Um, so it's brand new. And so, you know, the best thing a production designer's work can do is be unnoticed and make the person think that it's just a building that burned down when really it took a lot more work to get it to look like this when actually, in fact, it's a brand new construction just for this set, just for this scene. So production designers are gonna be doing all that kind of research to find these very specific things in the time periods and moments and draw inspiration from all of this stuff to um, make anything if it's based in like fantasy or science fiction, future, past, whatever, they're going to find inspiration of some sort or historical accuracy to get it to look as close as they can and then create the creative liberties and, and start messing with it and making their own variations and versions of this stuff um, to put their own creative input into it. This stuff comes from productiondesignerscollective.org. It is letter D underneath design and research in the syllabus. Uh, so this lady, Celia Barnett, was being asked how to conduct research for a film. She said you can do some of the research online, but she finds it better to go to physical places, go to a certain area. Like if you have the funding and if you have the ability to, you definitely want to be able to go there and like feel it out and see it in, in person. Um, because online you can see pictures and everything and you can get a good idea, but you're not really gonna get a full sense of the idea unless you see it in person. So go to a certain area, go to libraries, art collections, museums. Sometimes at libraries, the book you actually need might be right next to the one you're looking at. So doing research into that. When online, it might be a bit harder to connect from one thing to another. At a library, the same materials all right next to each other on the shelf. So you might be looking for a specific thing in 1960s architecture and then right next to it, you're getting exactly what you're looking for because it's in the specific area you're looking for or something like that. So um, sometimes you don't really know what you need until you find it. And that's why going to like a library or a museum might be beneficial if you are trying to conduct research for a film or for a time period. Online information can also be misinformed and isn't the most reliable of a source. For true accuracy, you need to go, you need to go to do the research. So you need to actually go to the place to do the research because online it's, it can be, it depends on where it's from, but it, you know, it can be very convoluted and, and can get fake and misinformed pretty quickly depending on how many sources you are extending yourself out to. Like if you're going to a base source, that's good. But then if you're going to a, another source that is basing it off of that source, they're gonna have their own interpretation on it. And then also, again and again, and again as it goes down the line and down the pipe, 
it's going to be probably less and less accurate the more also, people discuss a lot it. of a lot sorry honey i kept cutting off a, a lot of um websites like a lot of people don't know this but it's not just wikipedia a lot of websites they will allow you to add stuff without properly verifying it wikipedia is the most common and a lot of people were shocked to know like wait what so anyone can just add stuff to it yeah so that's another reason why you know you have to consider and be like okay is this a reliable source because now i'm pretty sure that over the years they've gotten like better at vetting but still like if people are adding millions of stuff every single day to it it's not going to be super easy to vet right so that's another thing and i would say um i know of some museums and libraries that have their entire collection and catalog digitized now so if you can't actually afford physically going there i would say the next best thing is to actually go to like a physical um museum or library's website and try to conduct your research there. That way you can have at least more verifiable and um, correct information or at least better sourced information, as well as all their catalogs and their um, collections of what they have. Uh, can You can look at them as well. So you can see like if it's a museum of uh, prehistoric history, then you can look and see what the different tools were and what the different people wore and all that stuff. And it can be all on and digital digitized on some museums and libraries, the bigger ones especially. Uh, she says you can also go, you can be go you know, talk with people if you can conduct interviews, if you have somebody who maybe lived during that time or was around or is a historian on that era. But that could also be part of your research a production designer might do. People with parents or grandparents or further back that live during those times, they might have a better idea of, you know, what their grandpa told them when they were kids and the stories they gave them and all of that to, to get a better idea of some of that stuff as well. They may conduct research by asking professionals and historians, historians professors, and more about that, their subjects. If the production has a separate researcher, then they're going to be the ones doing research and creating a, da a database of images, which everyone in the art department has access to. But if they don't have a separate researcher, it'll be up to the production designer mostly to, to do the research for the uh, art department as a whole. Everyone should do their own research based on the specific thing they're doing, like hair and makeup. Makeup should look at the makeup of that time in that area. Hair should look at the hair and all of that but the production designer should do an extensive overhaul research to kind of get an overview of everything so they can see and make sure everything is falling in line with the overall look and idea, as well as going along with those mood boards that we're talking about where they're making it so that everybody can have the sense and idea of what the look is going to be. And uh, Because they're basically the head of that department, so they have to oversee. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. And they have to see like if everybody's following along with what they're supposed to be as well and getting it close. Even for like sci-fi and fantasy, like I said, um, it's usually drawn upon some kind of source. So I know Star Wars uh, used this. They A lot of the outfits that were in like the prequels and things like that were from historical sources. You can see that on the left in the middle of drawing of it and then on the right, kind of like their it's sim it's similar but it has its own uniqueness to it but it does draw inspiration from that and you can definitely see the the resemblance so sci-fi and fantasy will do that a lot they'll try to find clothing that looks like that and she was a queen so they tried to find somebody who was a royalty or somebody who was very higher class so that you know that that's what they wore and that's kind of a good thing that that's kind of a good look than what we want to go with so Doing that kind of research to find inspiration for, for things that you're going to create that's just going to be similar to but not exactly accurate to is also something production designers do a lot. And then, like I said, a lot of the time creative liberties are taken, which 
makes something historically inaccurate, but is done for artistic or logistical reasons, like putting a street lamp in at a time that they wouldn't even have it, but perhaps it's close enough to that time that they could, or, or that they would, or that people wouldn't notice, you know, like maybe a decade or two later, they have, a, they have street lamps. So they're like, uh, is, is anyone really gonna notice? And logistically, it wouldn't make sense to light with like a hundred candles for the scene to get the same amount of lighting that they need. And so they just decide to go ahead and take that creative liberty and say, you know what, we're gonna put a street lamp in here so that we can film it the way we en envisioned it. Um, because you know all of that stuff goes into how it's gonna look in the camera. Or maybe they want to put the main character in a color that they probably wouldn't wear in that time period or that area or at that class level, but they want to put them in that color for a symbolic psychological reason or something to do with the story or their emotion that they're feeling at the time. So they go ahead and take the creative liberty to put them in that color. The main thing is that they know that they're doing that, that they're taking a creative liberty. Like I said, that is the main importance is uh, that they know what is accurate and that they know what isn't so that they can inform the director if something is going to be inaccurate or if something doesn't exactly go with what their what their story entails um, and then they can decide if that matters to them or not and then instead of it just going uh, in ignorance and everyone not knowing that that's what it oh they wouldn't wear blue because of whatever reason but we have a lot of characters in blue and we didn't even know that's a problem. But, oh yeah, we decided to put them in blue because you know we, we thought it would go with the emotion that they're all feeling at the time or whatever reason, uh, then that's not a problem. That's just something that they decided to do. Once a production designer does research on one film, they can also keep all of the research as references or they can keep it like, and their reference photos, they can keep all of that. So then anytime they have a similar project, they can just draw upon their ever expanding library of research for part of their research of the new project so that they don't have to start all the way from scratch. And that's just with any job, but production design, especially you can keep all of the same stuff that you've already learned about different time periods, different outfits, different, all of this stuff that we're talking about. Um, and you can keep expanding upon it so that if you need it for another film that wants to do something similar, but not exactly like that, you can draw upon some of the same inspiration, some of the same source material and go from there. Research can go beyond what's needed for the film alone, like reading books, journals, and diaries, other art of the period, and more to get context within that world. What was most important to people at the time, the issues, the news, and what was actually happening. So that can give the backstory and small details elements that makes a world feel real and lived in. And that's exactly what the production designer needs to do. They're doing all these little background elements that might not be noticed, but it might just make it seem more real. It might make it seem more believable and just have people just buy the buy into it that oh yeah it's this time period I, I just believe it because it looks and feels like it is <clears throat> when doing historical research for historical periods researchers or production designers should try to find primary sources which are sources that come from an individual or a group that lived during the time or participated in a, in a historical event the film is based on. So primary sources would be stuff like journals, memoirs, arrest records, speeches, letters, telegrams, emails, proclamations, government documents, and more. Most research begins with secondary sources and uses primary sources to get a better picture of it. So secondary sources come from someone who wasn't there during the time and or the event. And these could be stuff like history books, encyclopedias, academic articles, and more. So it's basically like a, if a historian made a, a uh, 
his thesis paper based on a certain time period and he's researched it and looked into it, his paper, if that's your source, is going to be the secondary source because he's basing it off of his research of the stuff he's looked into. But if you look into somebody who it was writing letters about the time or they had a diary or you know they did a speech based on it or something that they were personally involved in it then that would be the primary source that's more involved in seeing a different picture of it with either source a researcher or designer needs to also consider who when where what and why and you consider who is the author whether it's a primary or secondary source, are they or were they a scholar, a farmer, were they rich, were they poor, were they male, were they female? Because that's gonna make a difference of bias, biases. You know, like uh, during certain times, male, female, uh, scholars, farmers, rich, poor, they all think differently. Even now, if you look, talk to anybody now and they're from different class systems, different genders, different, whatever, they're going to have a different point of view on different things, depending on their outlook and what they've grown up with and what they, who they are as an individual. And so you need to, real, the, when you're doing the research for primary sources, they definitely need to uh, consider who the author is and if they have any biases like that and take that into consideration as they do the research, because a farmer might think that, uh, you know, living in the um, living in an immediate medieval time sucks because you know these people are coming in, they're taxing you every day, and you can barely get the food because it's getting all taken away from you and all this other stuff. Whereas, if you're looking at it from somebody who lived in a castle, they might think that that time period is great, and so you can't just say, "Oh, well, obviously, it's a great." time period and everybody loves it based on one person's source and you also can't say oh this is a horrible time period and everybody hated it based on that other person's source you have to kind of take a multiple sources and look into it and get a grand idea of the difference the differences between the different people that are looking into it this research can also go into when you're screenwriting and when you're um the director or the producer as well so a lot of this stuff is transferable but <clears throat> production designers or a specific researcher for a time period, if the film has it, need to, need to take all these things into account so that they can get a, a, a grand overview of the perspectives of different people during that time period. Perspective is everything and not every person is gonna view a situation the same, whether they lived it or not. Some people will say it was obviously bad because they were taking, you know, they were taking from farmers and doing this and that. And so they might have a bias against the rich people at the time. Uh, and so even if it's a secondary source, the same thing can happen based on what they think about their research. This is obviously a very, like, very try to exa example. We're trying to give like a non-problematic example. But basically the whole point is like different walks of life, different life experiences. What is your story? Who's your, who are, who are you trying to, whose point of view are you trying to tell in the story? Are you trying to be neutral? Are you trying to show all sides? Are you trying to show one specific side, a one specific perspective and point of view? Um, try to do your research and see how that affected the people of that time uh, period differently. What, um, what perspectives could have come from it? Sometimes the same thing, um, Ne isn't necessarily good or bad, but it can have positive consequences for one, but negative for another. So that's another thing that you have to think about when, if you're working with time periods, if you're working with um, political situations, if you're working with stuff like that, where is your story coming from and what exactly are you trying to show and, and tell? Or if you're not trying to, if you're just trying to be like an overview, or, oh, it, it's just taking place in that time period and we don't want to like say one thing or the other specifically. We just want to tell a story that just happened to be of that time period. You just, you can gloss over something without necessarily making a statement, just showing that it was there. 
Yeah, and so the production designer, of course, when they're doing the primary and secondary sources, they're looking for the different things that the people cared about, the things that, um, you know, and it, again, it's going to depend the Irishman, on- The Irishman is a good example of this. Like, um, if you guys have watched The Irishman on Netflix, it was a mafia story. It was told, I think in this, I don't remember correctly, I think in the 60s, something like that. And he kept talking about how he- hated Kennedy because they were Irish and they were very, you know, they, they hated the Kennedys. And it, they made a point of it because that was very much of the culture and of the people of the time. And in that community, they had a lot of disdain for the Kennedys and that kind of thing. And so they weren't trying to make a political statement, but they were trying to like show, yeah, this was the point of view at the time. This was how people felt about it in this community. And they just and it was part of their story and part of their culture and part of their lives. All right. And again, we're looking specifically right now at production design. No, I know. I'm just using the example because I feel like the example that you were trying to make was a little all over the place, but that's just my, I don't know. Could be wrong. Well, anyway, uh, for production design, it still is going to depend on like the secondary primary sources and everything because a teenage girl at the time might have put different things in a room, might have worn different colors, might have done this and that than a, an adult male or an older male that's about to pass away and he wants to give his stuff away to his kids. You know, they're going to have different looks, interiors, different, they're going to represent themselves differently, even if they live in the same time period, even if they live in the same class system. You know, maybe it's older. And then again, uh, even further into that, the character, depending on what kind of um, personality they have, could be different. There could be an old person that really wants to showcase their family as the strong and mighty um, uh, royalty family that is perfect. And so they're very concerned with how everyone looks, how they look, how to represent themselves, even if they're old. Whereas another old character, depending on their personality, they might not give a crap anymore. They might just be like, you know what? All that stuff was worthless. It's pointless. And I don't really care about that stuff anymore. So they don't care about looking good. They don't care about dressing up nice or any of that. So even though they live in the same exact time period, they had the same class system and the same experiences, depending on their individual personalities, that will also affect the production design elements that go into it which is why it's a lot for the production designer to kind of consider and think about when they're looking into all of this different stuff. Um, we can see this the most recently with the historical event, with the historical event of COVID with all the lockdowns. So depending on your age, your class, your gender, if you were an introvert or an extrovert and more, COVID could have been seen differently by each one. So, while I'm sure almost everyone agrees it was bad, some found it worse and had a harder time with it than others. Some were more fearful of it because if you're older, you had a more higher chance of, of passing from it. So, you know, they, they felt differently about it. So all those things go into it at any time period, at any place. And that's all stuff that needs to be taken into account when looking into the research for a project. This is why multiple sources is important when conducting research. You need a broader scale to see the bigger picture instead of just believing everything from one secondary source or one primary source. Then, depending on your character, you need, you need multiple sources from someone who may have been in their position or similar if possible. So if you want to get an idea of a teenage girl's perspective, you might read some diaries of a time period around then of a few different people from different class systems and things like that, if they're available. Um, that way you can get a broader perspective on what teenage girls thought of in that time and you know where they considered only with how they looked and finding a boyfriend or finding a girlfriend or whatever, or were they more concerned with helping their family survive and taking care of their family and finding a job and all of those things. It's really gonna depend based on where they're at and what time period they're from. Uh, bad empanada, which is letter A in the syllabus. How to research history, a guide to doing it properly. 
has a great video showing how to do historical research. So if you do want to try to be historically accurate with something, they actually have a video that I thought explained how to actually go about it really well. Basically, Ooh, you want to also... check, basically, you just want to check what the sources are and then question who is the author and did they maybe have certain bias and uh, who was their intended audience? Are they writing it to try to sway people to their thinking? A speech is probably made to try to sway people to the way they're thinking, um, whereas a diary might just be for their own personal thoughts. And those two things might contradict each other because they're trying to sound different to people uh, than how they actually feel. So it also depends say... on what the source is and those kinds of things and what the intended audience is going to be. And all of that is stuff you have to take into consideration when you're looking at historic history. There are also specific books on specific periods of history and how to um, and about production. Like we have a few of them. We have a few, right? Um, both about writing and about production, like how to uh, we have a few books on costumes and costumes for different time periods and costumes for different um, uh, uh, class systems and stuff like that. There are specific, there's specific content out there, uh, whether it be books, um, documentaries, stuff like that. But I, I know books because I, while we were looking through our media books, I found quite a few um, that are specifically about production design and specifically about different periods and working as a production designer for those different periods of time. So that's also something to look into if, if you're interested. Does anyone have any questions, comments, or anything to add about research for production design? Um, no, I wanted to say, like, when you're doing, I, if you're doing a documentary, isn't that sort of the same type of research you'd be doing for a documentary? Yeah, um, well, with a documentary, it's usually you're, you are trying to say something about the time period or the thing. So you will also have a, a bias in there, <laughs> most likely. So oh, right. we'll find like, um, it is the best way to do it is to try to find information from all sides and then kind of pick and choose what you want to put in there. But with, with most documentaries, that's how they do it. They find a bunch of different information and then they put kind of what goes along with their narrative into it because otherwise the movie would be way too long and if you're trying to get a message across, you have to just kind of showcase the stuff that matches that message, if, if that makes sense. Yeah, it does. Mm -hmm. But yeah, the, the historic, the history and like the um, research and stuff like that, you would still take these different things into account when doing a documentary as well, or you should, uh, to find different sources of information, whether you use them or not, at least so you have a broader scale of, of what you're trying to do in that, in that oh. documentary. Oh, okay. All right, so. Because the whole point of a documentary is to um, tell a certain narrative, show a certain perspective more often than not. Um, it, it's a lot harder for you to have a documentary that doesn't have some specific um, perspective or some specific angle because the whole point of a documentary is showing something, you know? It's not just, oh, we're, we're telling a story. It, it, it can be like getting multiple perspectives, but more often than not, there Down will be it. something a, something that yeah. they're trying to tell. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. All right. So next we're talking about architecture in production design. And I noticed this after I posted, but I spelled uh, architecture wrong up here. <laughs> it's spelled right down here. I'm so uh, disappointed to be married to him. <laughs> architecture. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, um, architecture and production design, they kind of have similarities when you're looking at it. There's not too much information to this, so we'll just kind of go through it pretty quickly. This comes from archdaily.com, letter A in the syllabus under architecture. A production designer named Luca Trancino discusses how production design and architecture share some of the same language but are very different. The primary purpose of production design 
and creating the buildings and city layout for it is to help convey the story, the message, and the world through the character's eyes and mind. So whether it's dark and gritty and depressing, you have something that's uh, supposed to look something like this maybe, or whether it's supposed to be bright and hopeful and shining. Magical and awe-inspiring. Production design is going to use space, color, texture, graphics, and symbols to bring the audience to other worlds. And you'll see this. Hopefully, you can tell the difference between different movies, uh, especially when they're doing like sci-fi cities and things like that. For the most part, you can tell them apart. And it is good to have a uniqueness to them to where you can tell that this is from either Blade Runner, Star Wars, or um, Star Trek, or other sci-fis that are more popular, Doctor Who. Um, but you know, sometimes they kind of blend together and that, that can be not very good. But with production designer with, with architecture, they just need to think about the space. Does it need to feel like it's confined and like it's very tight? and like there's no room to breathe or doesn't need to feel like there's a wide open space. Even if it's in a city, it could be a completely different layout to make it feel like, again, it's very tight, it's very gritty, it's very confined. Um, and there's like so many people all over each other because there's no room to go anywhere, walk. Or it could be a city where even though it has a bunch of buildings and it has a lot of people, it still has more wide open streets and it's a lot easier to navigate and there's more space so it feels more open. And they'll usually do this on purpose to try to help convey the story of what it's supposed to be. Batman with Gotham, they always make it really dark and they always make it really dirty and messy and kind of tight in most areas so that it feels very confined and feels very suffocating because it's supposed to be like that. With production design, you can build structures that are considered impossible by the laws of nature. So you can make something that can fly away with a bunch of balloons, you know, something that obviously could never happen if you were making it for real. Or you can introduce materials that don't exist. So you can have a building that glows in the dark. You can have a building that uh, shines blue and then shines gold and changes color depending on what kind of material you've made up. And so production design, you can have a lot of creativity with it depending on what you're going for and what works with the film. When going from the idea and concepts to the actual construction of the sets, many stages happen to get it to an actual constructible state, like technical drawings, blueprints, miniature models and other things to ensure the look is good, but that it's also practical and sturdy and safe. So it's important for production designers and art directors to know how buildings actually work. So something like this, a cathedral and like how many pillars does it have and how are they interconnected and where and that way, when they're making a fake one, they kind of have a better idea of how it might look in the end goal, even if they're just making partial and they're not actually gonna make a real one that's supposed to be you know, sturdy for as long as an actual cathedral is. What I wonder, honey, um, because some of it I didn't get to, um, did they mention if when they're creating the set, because um, I know that there's such a thing as like the temporary walls that, don't, that are just there to like be walls, but do they actually, I know that sometimes they actually have to create like the whole structures, correct? But like, do they create uh, the structures with specific, I would imagine, specific placements for where the camera is going to go? Because I saw that in Love, the TV show Love, they chose a place um, where the architecture had like these, it was like this old Spanish thing, and they had the little places where they could actually put the camera and get those angles. Sometimes so you, it depends on budget. 
sometimes with the largest budgets, they're just like, let's make the whole thing. And that way we can shoot whichever way we want. Uh, I actually saw a behind the scenes on a Game of Thrones episode. I think it was the one where they throw off, uh, what was it called? It was like the green fire stuff from the ship. They were going to do the entire ship when all they really needed to show was just one half of it. Mm -hmm. So the production designer, because they were starting to run out of funding for the season, they were like, hey, why don't we just, you know, make half of the ship and only show it from this side because that's all we really need instead of creating the whole thing unnecessarily. Oh, yeah, I remember the scene. So uh, it really depends on that and how how much budget they have to do it. Sometimes it's better to create the whole thing so that they have the freedom of choosing when they get there. And other times they want to try to um, save the budget by just kind of creating the most, like, like for this cathedral, for instance, if this was just a set, they might just say, we're gonna shoot mostly in this direction. So let's give most of the um, design elements to this side and the other side can have pillars and stuff too but they aren't going to be as detailed. There's not going to be as much stuff. The ceiling isn't going to have all that design texture in it. Um, and, you know, there's not going to be as much design elements and all of the architecture and all of the... But the do you think it's a very common thing to build a structure with the specific angles in mind? Yeah, of, like, like, like I shots? think depending on the budget, they definitely focus on certain areas more of like what they need to do and, and what they want to do. So they would probably be in constant communication with the director um, when setting up because like, okay, so what kind of shots are you thinking about? Are you thinking of so that we can build specifically to cater to those shots and to so that we don't overbuild, but also so that we give you freedom to move around in that space. Yeah, so they usually talk to the director, the cinematographer you know, those kinds of people that are going to affect that stuff. And then they'll talk to like the, um, basically they'll talk to whoever's going to have an impact on the look and the design of that in frame stuff. So then the, they'll, uh, they'll, they'll get a sense of what, what is most needed and what is most essential. And then like what is kind of just like not as important, what's going to be more yeah. background element. Because I remember seeing that a lot with specific shots, like with Hill House, um, for those of if you guys have seen The Haunting of Hill House, they have multiple shots where it's just huge long takes. And in episode five, they have like a rotating one where they showed the behind the scenes of it and they would move the, the walls uh, to move the camera around and they'd have to do it like quickly because it was all in one take. And I would imagine for something like that, building a set like that, they would have to sit with the director and see what the shot that he wanted to do and build work around that, work around the specific shot list, for example. Yeah, and again, it depends on the budget. So for TV shows, they, uh, depending on the budget, they might make a, a, a whole building because they're going to film there multiple times. And so they're going to use that set a lot and they're gonna to return to it and they might wanna shoot it in different areas. Or it might be a cheaper show where they're just like, no, let's make what we need for the episode. And then we'll just keep going back to that same area, even though they've created you know, some other parts. You can think of that, that like the sitcom, um, that 70s show, the library little room is definitely not as detailed and, and production design wise as the rest of the house because they don't really shoot over there in that set as much. Yeah. Because I, I just wondered that because I was like, I, I would imagine that when building those sets, you would have to have at least some of the idea of what the shot list is going to be like, or some of the idea of what the director is going for, for you to build it as well. Because other you have to have that framework, that frame of reference of, okay, what is he going for? What, what angles is he trying to go for? What are we going to shoot to be able to build that structure? Yeah, exactly. And so like this whole, this if this was a, a, a set, it, it might be all real material right here, or it might be half of the pillars are inside, they're made of metal, and then it's like styrofoam or it's some other material on the outside that's just carved to make it look like stone or make it look like some kind of material that would be holding up a heavy church. When in reality, it's just a, a framework with the design elements on top of it to make it look like it's a sturdy building. But the, the point, um, of this was like the, the production designers and set designers need to know 
what goes into these buildings so that they know like what to make it look like and also realistically to make a safe if it's a double storied church and they're going to go on the second story they need to definitely make sure that it's safe enough for them to walk across and that there's no parts that they're just going to like fall through or they're going to but that would also clean. be specifically to the people in the production design that are in charge of building those structures because there are specific people in the construction charge crew yeah yeah right but production designer still needs to know what goes into it so that they can um understand Overlay, yeah. budget wise and all of that stuff like what they're going to be needing so they might be doing research into that or just know skyscrapers you know all that type of stuff it's all built differently so depending on the building that you're looking at, the architecture style and design, uh, it's going to be out of different materials to create that, that building. And then they need to also think of how the design will match or purposefully clash with the story, emotion, characters, or the theme of the film. So in this cathedral, we have red over the floors, and they might decide to have, and there's, you know, blue in the windows and gold in the back. And they might decide to change those colors around to match the story more, even though in a typical cathedral, you might not find this style, this design, or this look. It might not be made out of this material, but they want to do it because they want to make it um, fit and match the story. And that's where those creative liberties come in again. So whenever you're talking about an actual architect, they are, they are designing buildings that need to hold up against different weather, different things, different um, design elements, not design elements, different elements, weather elements, and they need to uh, make it structurally sound and make sure that it has the layout that is that looks good and that um, will hold up and that the people want if they are getting contracted to do it. Whereas a production designer has a lot more freedom in that they still need to know many of those different aspects of like making a building and like architecture and being an architect in a way, but they have a lot more creative freedom to be able to make it unrealistic as well as realistic, depending on what is needed. And, you know, if they're going to make a house that's going to be floating away with balloons or if they're going to make a life size actual looking cathedral, then it'll depend on, you know, what kind of architecture needs to actually go into that. But yeah, does anyone have any questions or comments or anything to add about architecture and production design? And this goes back into research again. Uh, this would be, you know, different buildings are designed differently interiorly and exteriorly. So that's something that they'd have to look into and see what they want to kind of match it with and draw inspiration from to make something similar or different from a certain time period or, or area because it's all going to be very different. There might be carvings in the walls and they might have different symbols or different paintings, different stuff like that, depending on where the building is and what time period it's, it's in. All right, next thing we're talking about is sitcom formulas and structures. This stuff comes from Slate, a channel called Slate. It's letter A in the syllabus, the hidden sitcom formula. They go over a structure that many sitcoms use. The first four minutes is usually an introductory scene finding out what the characters want. The main obstacle keeping the characters from there once is next, right around, right after the introduction scene. So maybe like five minutes in. The next two minutes show the plan that the character comes up with to overcome the obstacle and get their goal. And so we're about five minutes to seven minutes into the episode typically so far. And we've kind of understood what the what the character wants in this episode what's blocking them from getting it and what their plan is to overcome that obstacle all in the first few minutes the middle section of the sitcom has them hit a roadblock and attempt plan b 
they hit another sub roadblock, rinse and repeat over and over again, trying different things to overcome this roadblock and things not working out so that they can try another one and another one until they finally get it. And this is where the humor arises from how each individual character tries to deal with each new roadblock or obstacle. After the roadblocks and trying to overcome them, we get to around two to five minutes from the end of the episode. And that's when the final attempt to get what they want happens. And then it's either a success, they get what they want, or a failure, they don't get what they want. And then around a minute or less before the end of the episode, we see if there are any long-term effects on the characters or if everything's basically returned to normal. This next up comes from Tyler Mowry, letter B in the syllabus. He discusses how he reads an article from The Atlantic dot com discussing breaking the sitcom code or its writing structure and uh he is similar to what the other guy said but it's he splits up the time a bit differently he says the first one to three minutes is a, a teaser joke it's setting the mood and the tone for the show it doesn't really have to do with the story it just kind of is a random joke you can see this a lot in sitcoms especially stuff like friends how i met your mother um, Fresh Prince of Bel-Air, they have like this opening joke, which doesn't really tie into anything. It just kind of shows the characters and their interactions. And then it leads into the theme song until it gets to the actual episode. From minutes three to eight, the trouble where the character faces a new situation they want to deal with in the episode. The B plot usually comes up in minutes three to eight as well, so that you can kind of start seeing the two stories play together. From minutes eight to 13, it will be what the article writer calls the muddle. Another major obstacle blocks the character. Minutes 13 through 18 is the triumph or the failure. They get what they want as planned or they don't. Then the minutes 19 through 21, they call it the kicker. Nothing has really changed in the world. The characters are dealing with the same problems. That way we can watch them again next episode and they're the same character. They don't grow. They usually don't go through major growth from episode to episode. It takes quite a while for that to start happening in sitcoms because otherwise the characters would change too drastically over the course of seasons. Normally, it's more subtle um, over the season or over the show in general, like little here and there, subtle changes, subtle shifts. Yeah, because many, many, many viewers don't even want the characters to change, or at least not too much, because otherwise they're not going to be the same characters, and they're not going to have the same dynamic with the other characters if they it just also completely change their point of view. It also isn't realistic, because humans don't change like that humans don't change in one in, a, in one episode would be like what a few weeks or a few days that's not how humans change normally even if you do go some go through something it takes time for you to adapt to that for you to grow from that for you to change so to speak from that but i definitely recommend watching both of those videos because they give examples breaking down episodes of different sitcoms to kind of show some of them show like two or three different episodes of uh different sitcoms and they're not two or three episodes two or three different sitcoms one of their episodes and they show how that formula kind of goes into each one and and uh, explains it as they go through it and you can really start to see exactly what they're talking about as they go through each episode I think they use Seinfeld and uh, Rick and Morty and that, and they use a few other ones to kind of show how they all sort of follow the same formula. And if you go back over what we just talked about, even though they both gave kind of different timestamps in a way in each episode, they were both basically explaining the story wheel, which we already talked about before, but sitcoms use this a lot so that if there's a structure to each episode and that each episode follows a similar um, layout. 
So they start out in a zone of comfort. So they're, that's where the uh, opening joke might come from. Or it's just a place where they've already been. Friends, they start out in the coffee shop. They've seen them there all the time. They make a joke, something like that. They desire something. Uh, they, that, well, that's when we figure out what they want for that episode and what they might, what might be blocking them comes next. They enter into an unfamiliar situation. So they want something, but they're going to have to get over some kind of roadblock. Maybe they're too afraid. Maybe they want to go out with this girl, go ask her out on a date, but they're too afraid because they, they're not very good at that thing. So they're going to have to overcome that obstacle and figure out how to get over that. And then they adapt to the situation. Now there's people getting in the way. There's other people going up and talking to the person and, and all these different situations. She's getting a phone call and, you know, from her mom or from somebody who's taking up her attention. And so now they're trying to adapt to that situation so that they can eventually try to ask her out. Number five, they get what they desired or they don't, I would say. So they either they get her number or they don't. Um, paying a heavy price for winning, that's not always the case, depending on what the sitcom is. Uh, but maybe they were supposed to go to a movie with their other friends, but they took so long trying to get to talk to this girl that they ended up not being able to go to the other thing they wanted to do because they kept trying to get this one thing. And that happens sometimes in sitcoms where they're waiting in a restaurant the whole time and they're trying to get a seat at the table or something. Actually, that's sign a, a episode of Seinfeld. They're trying to get a seat at the table, but they want to go see a movie. They keep trying to go into the, um, getting the seat at the table and the people keep telling them to wait, wait, we have, wait a few minutes. And then they keep letting other people go by and go sit down and they're like, well, we were here first. And it becomes this whole thing for the whole episode. and. Uh, so they don't really get to sit down until way later when the movie's getting ready to start and they have to decide whether they stay at the restaurant or whether they leave and they either get what they want or they don't, but they pay that price of losing the other thing they were trying to do. Then they return to their familiar situation um, and they are back with the, you know, the, the zone of comfort pretty much. And then if they've changed at all, if there's any slight changes, if it was trying to get a girl or a guy's number and they did, that is a slight change. They might have a new relationship for the show for a few episodes or for more maybe, um, but not necessarily. And so they might not have changed at all. And so that's usually how the, the sitcoms kind of follow that same flow. You can apply this to different storylines and different beats, but they usually typically follow something similar to this. Like I said, they necessarily don't pay a heavy price every time, but they can depending on what it is. But they do <clears throat> go into those familiar situations, unfamiliar situations and try to adapt to it. And then we know what they want and how they're trying to get it with their plans. And then they keep failing and failing um, and trying different things. And then until they finally either get it or they don't. And then they go back to what they were doing before. And it kind of repeats itself over and over again. And then it might change later on, depending on the show. But uh, sitcoms typically tend to stay to that same formula so that they can keep having things that are familiar and have some sort of structure, even if the stories underneath are different. <clears throat> this stuff comes from a channel called Film Fix. It's letter C in the syllabus. They specifically are talking about comedy. So it's more than just jokes and one-liners, I say. First, you need to truly know your characters. You need to put them in the situations and then the jokes can come from that, from how they react in those situations based on their character traits. Some might actually make a joke, some with observational humor, and one-liners, you know, that might be their character. Chandler and Friends, he, he does that all the time. That's his character. That's who he is. But not every character will do that. Or that wouldn't be their first instinct anyway. They may have a comeback or they might add on to a joke, but they can also not make any jokes at all. 
Think of your characters if they were in a creepy place. They hear a loud noise. Some might scream a, that there's a ghost and run away. Some might be scared but act tough until it happens a second time and then they go run away. Some might not be afraid at all and reveal what was making the noise like a tree hitting the window or other circumstance. And some might make a joke or make fun of the other characters for running away and being babies. The characters should all be unique and handle the situation differently. And that's where you can have all that different styles of humor come in or it's the same style of humor but it's like different jokes it's not just them all cracking jokes and being wise uh it's them reacting differently and that's where some of that humor comes from yeah it doesn't necessarily mean that you need to create characters that are stereotypes or that are one note either like there are plenty of sitcom characters that are very different that have very different reactions that bring different uh, um, styles of comedy to a show um, or other things that are are three-dimensional so try to if you are if that's the thing you're going for try to keep that in mind and not make it too stereotypical or too one note because people need to be the whole thing of sitcoms is yes laughter but also relatability it's a situation comedy so if you create characters and you try too hard to make them one note or to make them this one personality trait and that's it, people aren't going to connect to your story either. Yeah. And the reason why people watch sitcoms is because they like the characters. They like the different humor that they bring and the different reactions that they get. Don't change your character to try to make a joke. This happens all of the time with like the dumb or the stupid characters, the writers, I feel like every time the writers eventually make them dumber than they ever were before, just to start making some jokes with them. But like when they begin with them, yeah, they're dumb. They're not as clever as other characters, but they still aren't like complete morons. But then like later on, and like once they start running out of ideas, it feels like they just start making them really, really stupid to the point where it's just like, over the top and ridiculous so they can try to shove in some jokes for that character um, and it just doesn't feel like that character anymore it doesn't feel as earned and it's usually not as funny for people because it's not as clever and it doesn't match that character that they've been watching there are many different kinds of comedy like silly witty surreal cynical raunchy Cringy, observational, dark, self-deprecating, parody, deadpan, and more. So generally a sitcom's tone will have an overall tone and comedy style, but that doesn't mean all the characters need to be that same style. Yeah, you look at an example is It's, it's Always Sunny. It's always sunny in Philadelphia. I don't know if it would even be considered a sitcom, but some people do consider it a sitcom. And it is very mean-spirited. All the characters kind of not great people. Um, same thing with Seinfeld. They all kind of suck. And they know they suck. So it doesn't necessarily have to be a bunch of happy-go-lucky, good people, perfect. You know, it can be different styles of comedy. Even if it is the same style of comedy, it doesn't have to mean that they're all silly. If you look at shows like SpongeBob or Psych, where you have like, in Psych, you have Sean and Gus being silly. In SpongeBob, you have SpongeBob and Patrick being silly. But that doesn't mean that every other character is as silly as they are. Sometimes it even plays off better when you have something like Squidward or you have something like Lassiter. Um, to play off of the characters and not buy into their silliness and just treat them like, oh, you're annoying. Because it, also helps it when adds to that. Oh, sorry. It adds to the, the humor that's there. And if they were all silly, it would be, I, I feel like it wouldn't play as well and it would be very um, repetitive and get kind of boring. Go ahead, honey. Oh, sorry. Like I said, the internet cuts sometimes, so it sounds like you're done and you're not. There you um, go. But basically, it also, like, one thing that really helps is, for a lot of people, it helps them suspend their disbelief, because 
when a, when a premise is really ridiculous, like in Psych, um, it's good to have some of those deadpan characters or some of that balance. So you're like, okay, this show isn't taking itself super seriously. It knows that it's ridiculous. It knows that it's a pretty like out there, crazy, kooky thing. And it's aware of that, but it's it can still be funny. And the fact that it's aware of that makes it so that you're not overanalyzing or you're not thinking like no one in this universe would be thinking this is ridiculous, I guess. Especially when you're doing a live action like Psych with a very crazy premise like it is. <laughs> yeah. And so having unique characters that have their own personality traits can really help to create the funny and comedic moments by having the characters clash and having them act differently. And that's why it's a situational comedy and why you have different characters is you're trying to have different, like you're trying to have humor show throughout how the different characters react to the similar situations. And like, I, I already gave that example of them going through the creepy place and some running away, some making fun of them and some being like, guys, it's just a tree hitting the window. You know, so it's different comedy all throughout, depending on how you write it and what the timing of it is and the editing and everything like that, of course, the performance. But to make the humor really stand out, you don't just want to have the one-liners and the jokes. It's actually a lot more than just that. In Afterlife, the that's a show on Netflix with Ricky Gervais. The main tone and style is cynical humor. But not all the characters within it are cynical. Some of the people at his workplace are very hopeful and very uh, different. And the mailman is very different. And all these characters are very different. So they can clash with that main style of, of comedy. Even though the overall tone is still the cynical humor, it uh, every single line that comes out of it isn't cynical. And it's one of those few shows. For those that haven't watched it, I highly recommend it. it it's, it's really good. Um, it is one of the few shows that balances it really well. Like there are moments when you're watching it and you are laughing and then it's like, whoa, that was depressing. And it's like, well, that was heavy. And then you're crying. Like, oh, this is so sad. And then you're laughing again. It feels very weird, but it balances because there's, there's that balance of, of characters and of situations that, um, helps make the world more lived in the world more real and helps balance out the sad moments balance out the comedy balance even though there's sometimes a little more than a horror of sadness than if you watch comedy. most sitcoms you'll see that the best ones or the best rated ones or the ones that are considered best anyway uh typically they're not complete comedy they also yeah. do the serious moments they know when to take a step back and let the characters really feel the moment, even if it's a sad moment, even if it ends on a sad moment, they allow it to happen because it shouldn't all just be funny and silly for the most part. Some sitcoms are made just to be silly and funny and, and not to take anything seriously and they work out. But the best rated ones typically for the most part are the ones that do kind of all of those things together and they play them off well. Most of it's comedy, but they also know when to have a serious and sad or dramatic moment and not make a joke out of it. And it's also partially because of who we are as people and our, our psychology, because when we see a moment like that, sometimes, even if it is a comedy, we want the people, like we care about these characters. We want them to be able to feel it. We wanna see them go through it and 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 have that emotion and that connection that human connection so when you find that balance and you allow your comedic show to be more realistic or to have those moments of connection with the audience of humanity it really grounds your show and it doesn't take away from the humor it it, it connects you more to those characters and it makes in some points it even makes them funnier because you like them more at the end of the day so you yeah, kind of more relatable at that. Yeah. So you really want to know your characters, put them in the different situations, and then have them react how their characters would and have the humor come out of that. 
not just from everybody cracking a wise joke and, and trying to be funny because that rarely ever works out. Maybe for one character because that's who they are, but not for the entire show and the entire cast because it just starts to get old and feel like they're trying too hard to be funny. Um, that's typically how it's taken. I mean, you might have some, some examples that prove me wrong, but for the most part, that's how it is. All right, so this next thing comes from nofilmschool.com. Remember also for the formatting of a TV show script, you'll have to first decide if it's going to be a single cam sitcom or multi-cam sitcom because the format of the script is going to be different based on which one it is. For single cam scripts, they're basically the same as short and feature film scripts. The only major difference being you want to clearly define your act breaks. So this would be like a single cam script. It looks very similar to what you've seen before if you've looked at any scripts of people's films or short films or a uh, single cam sitcom. Only difference would be this thing that's like the end of act one. After that, there'd be a page break and they would start a new page that says beginning of act two and it'd be underlined like that, all caps. And then it would follow that format. You don't really do that in feature films or short films, but in sitcoms, they want that so that they can tell when the best time to um, insert a commercial would be. For, uh, usually, that's why, that's the reason. They want to clearly see the act breaks. Another reason could be that there could be multiple people writing the episode. And so they'll each be given an act. And so they're like, you do act one, you do act two. And that way they know who to go to uh, if it's part of act one and it hasn't gone into act two yet. And so that could be another reason why they separate it like that. But other than that, the dialogue, the characters' names, the action description, and the headers and everything else is pretty similar to what you would see in a feature film script or a short film script. However, if it is multicam, that is when it looks a lot different. If it's multicam, the formatting is going to be a bit different. Again, you mark the act breaks, the beginning and end of each, and you would do a new page for the next act, just like you would with the other scripts, with a single cam script. But for the multicam script, the slug lines are also known as the headers. This part right here, the interior theater, four hours later underlined, whereas in the single cam script, whoops, it's not. It's not usually underlined, it's just, it's all caps and it says interior and whatever. But for whatever reason, multi-cams, they have those underlined. All action description is going to be capitalized. So if you look at the action description right here, we pan across each of the group's stunned faces. You can see it's all in caps. And that's not typically found in a single cam or a feature film script. Usually you only capitalize the stuff that you want to point out, like certain sounds or introducing a character. But in a multi-cam script, all action description is capitalized. Oftentimes characters are going to be put in parentheses that appear underneath the header. So you can see that right here. I think this is from Friends. Well, yeah, it is definitely. Rachel, Monica, Phoebe, Joey, Chandler, Ross, and Aurora. Those are the characters who appear in this scene is basically what they're saying. Right off like the we bat. said, we're not trying. It's just the most <clears throat> common one you find online. The most common <laughs> examples. Yeah, for multi-cam scripts, this is the most common one to, to, to look at, I guess. Dialogue in multi-cam scripts is double-spaced for some shows, which may increase the page count. And this one, you can see that it is. Monica, underneath her, she has her lines of dialogue, and then there's a space between them that's double-spaced dialogue. Whereas in the single cam script, Dr. Spaceman, underneath that, it's all like you would see in a feature film or a short film script. So that can also be different depending on the studio or the network and what they want from the um, scripts. And because sitcoms are based mainly on dialogue, it can definitely extend the page count 
So you can't just say, if you're doing a multi-cam script, you can't go off of the one page equals one minute of screen time. Like you can, well, you can't always go off of that, but you can do, it definitely has a better chance of being accurate when you're doing single cam or feature film scripts because they are made for that in mind to try to match one page to one minute of screen time. Whereas a multi-cam script, because it's double spaced with the dialogue and some of them, they won't be matching up. So you can't just write 30 pages and say, I'm done because you're not gonna have enough to fill out a 30 minute episode. Also in multi-cam scripts, parentheticals are used more often and they're also part of the dialogue line. You can see that where it says Chandler and right where it says Ross. Parentheticals are the things that go in parentheses that describe how they say it or who they are saying it to. Feature films and short films and single cam scripts, you don't see those as much. Kind of let the director of the episode decide how it's going to be said or the actors themselves. And so you don't put those, but in multi-cam scripts, again, I'm not sure exactly why, but they put them in and they combine it with the dialogue. With a single cam script, it would be right underneath the person's name and then you would have their dialogue. So if, if it had it here, it would have Dr. Spaceman and then it would have whispering in parentheses right underneath his name and below that would be his dialogue. But in a multi-cam script, it's all combined together, parentheticals with the dialogue, double-spaced. Character, if a character has an entrance or an exit, like if they come through a door or if they walk into the scene, that's usually those moments where you hear like, woo! Those are usually underlined. And that's because it stands out. It's because it's gonna draw a few moments of time, things like that, because the person entering is usually going to get some kind of applause or some screen time just to show that they are entering that space. Sounds are called out with a colon. So if you're trying to uh, show a specific sound in a single cam script, you would make it all capitalized. So if you said there was a crash, you would have everything be in lowercase up here, but then you'd have crash, all caps, and that really calls attention to it. But because multi-cam scripts have their action description in all caps already, you have to um, separate it by saying sound, colon, crash. And that way it stands out. Sometimes it can be underlined as well. And that way it can stand out. You actually call out, you say sound this, whatever the sound is. So uh, that, that way it separates it from the rest of the description. So it really stands out, stands apart. And then uh, of course, all the acts should have page breaks between them. So whenever you end that act, this is act one. When it ends, you should do a page break and not write anything else on that page because act two should start on the next page, even if it only goes down one fourth of the page for the last little bit. Doesn't matter, page break it to the next part. On their website, they were also showing how a three act structure for a sitcom might be played out. <clears throat> it acts kind of like a five act structure, but the first part, the cold open or the teaser doesn't have to be connected to the story. We already talked about that with the other guy. The other guy said the same thing. The teaser could be just a joke. It could be connected to the story and kind of set up what's, what's to come but it could also just be something that's disconnected and just a joke for a joke's sake, just to kind of set the tone and the feel of what's to come next. Similarly, tag at the bottom underneath act three could be a final joke of the aftermath of the episode or something kind of forgotten about, like a character locked in a locker or a closet. And then like, you know, that was, that was just like a little side thing that happened earlier in the episode. And we're following along with the plot B and plot A, and we're not really paying attention to that. And then at the very end, they kind of call back to it. Like, remember this, they forgot to get them out of the closet. They forgot to get them out of the locker. Or it could be a, another 
joke talking about the aftermath of what just happened in the episode, but oftentimes it's not as connected to the story as act one, act two, and act three. So the main difference between this and a five act structure is a five act structure is a story that's all connected. It's just broken up into different pieces, more pieces than this. So it'd be five different pieces broken up to insert different commercials and things like that into it. Whereas a three act structure with a teaser and a tag, it's kind of like a five act structure, except for the teaser or the cold open and the tag you don't really have to be as related to the rest of it and definitely isn't part of the main story. And if it is, it's basically just like a side or an aftermath thing that uh, comes out of it. So both can be part of the story or disconnected from it. Otherwise, mostly all structures follow the same trajectory as everything you've heard before, no matter how you split it up, whether you do the hero wheel or you do a three act, a four act, five, six act, however many acts you wanna do, they're all gonna set up <clears throat> pretty much the same trajectory, which will be a setup in the beginning for however many acts, the problems, the middle, you know, that stuff, uh, that's gonna be act two, three, whatever, however many acts you have. So let's just go with this three act structure. In the first act, you're gonna have the setup. The second act, you're gonna have the problems and then trying to overcome the problems. And the third act, you're going to have the conclusion. But then if you do a five act structure, you might have the very beginning idea of what they want in the first act. You might have the setup of how they're gonna get it done in the second act. You might have them trying to get their first plan across in the third act. Then you might have them try to get through plan B, C, D, and, and E in the fourth act. And then you might have the final conclusion in the fifth act. It really just depends on how you wanna break it up. But for the most part, they're gonna follow that same flow of just set up the problems and how to overcome them. And then the final conclusion. This website, wgfoundation.org, kind of showed how it might be broken up with different acts. Um, they said like back before they really did acts, they just had places for the commercials to go. And so they would just kind of have an episode and they'd break it into pieces and say, this commercial is gonna go here, here, and there. So write a story, <clears throat> 15 pages later, we're gonna do a commercial. So try to have it in somewhere that's going to be good for a commercial. Then later on with the Andy Griffiths show, and other things, they started doing act breaks to give a better spot for the commercial to go. And that's where they maybe do a two act structure where it's just one big act, a second act, and then the tag or the little aftermath joke. Then they could have done, they started doing maybe like the teaser with act one, act two, and then the tag at the end, act one, act two, and then act three. And then they started doing the cold opening or the teaser again with the act one, act two, act three, and tag, which would still be just a three act structure. Uh, they say the office uses that structure where they have a cold opening. It's a joke that doesn't necessarily tie in with it, everything, or it sort of sets up the, the story. And they do act one, act two, act three. And then they do the aftermath joke during like the credits or whatever. New Girl and Superstore use four acts often without specifying a cold open or a tag. So they just have four different acts to it. Brooklyn Nine-Nine uses a four act structure, but they also have a cold opening in the beginning where it's just a disconnected joke. And so like you can see that it just gets broken down more and more. The length is going to be the same. You still have to have it be whatever length they need it to be under 30 minutes. If you have it on a network, they usually need it to be like 22 minutes because it's gonna be like eight minutes of commercials on a 30 minute slot. Um, and so depending on how you wanna do it, that would be how you break up the acts and kind of figure out what you want to have happen in each thing. But if you go and look at sitcoms and you actually look at how the show is, you can see when you first start it, do they do a cold opening? Do they do just a random joke that kind of sets up the story or doesn't even set it up at all? 
Is it just kind of a standalone joke to show how these characters interact with each other? And then you can see act one, and at a certain minute point, you can probably see when they start to get into act two, especially if you're watching it on a um, television network when they do a commercial. That's typically, they set it up that way on purpose to make it end the act at each commercial break, uh, which if they structured it well, should be the way they did it. But sometimes that cannot be the case. If you're watching it on streaming services and stuff, they can just sometimes enter in commercials in random places, even in the middle of a line of dialogue, which can be very annoying, but uh, it's just, that's just how they set them up. But on an actual network where they're paying attention to all of that, and they're, they're taking into account that there will be commercials, um, the acts usually follow the commercial setup. But, but if you just watch a show, even on a streaming service without commercials, you can usually see if you really pay attention, you can usually feel the difference between like when the act one stops and when act two and three and four, if they have four acts, begins. And you can kind of see the structure. And if you find a structure in one of the shows that you watch, you can see that structure play throughout all of the rest of the episodes because they typically stick to the same structure for each episode. With if they, if they have A, B, and C plots, most of the episodes are going to have A, B, and C plots. Some sitcoms only have A and B's plots. So they just have a one main plot and one side plot. And so you can see that. So if you just go and look at that at any sitcom, once you find it, you can spot it in each episode. And you can probably look it up online, honestly, if you want to really see what a different show does. I'm sure somebody's already done the, the uh, digging for you and found out what kind of act structure they use. The important part of all of this is just to keep in mind that just because it is structured doesn't mean that it takes away creativity. A lot of uh, independent writers and things like that, they want to try to break the mold as much as they can. And so they don't want to stick to any kind of structure. But with TV shows and sitcoms, it's definitely really important to kind of have that there because it, it gives an idea of what's to come for the show and gives an idea of what people are getting when they're watching each episode. So it's not different episode to episode. Um, especially because you are working with a shorter time frame. So mo more often than not, sitcoms, sitcoms will be shorter. So because you're working with that short time frame, the act structure can really help you stay in focus and tell a cohesive story in that short amount of time. Yeah, exactly. And so that's why they'll usually set it up. And that's why you have this writing team that is talking about all of these episodes for the season so that they can really break down like, you know, what happens in this episode and this and that and make an outline and then expand it and expand it until they have the full episode written. Because if you, if you don't do that and you're start trying to start a show and you're trying to do a pilot episode and you don't want to have a structure, it's just going to be a lot harder for you to, want, first of all, get a network to be interested in it. And second of all, to, um, to kind of give the idea of what the show is going to be like to the network. So. If you don't have a structure, it's not as professional, but it's also harder on a like to figure out what the rest of the show is going to be like, because if every episode is set up differently, um, it is confusing and weird and it doesn't feel like it comes from the same creators or writers and it feels disjointed, which is usually why sitcoms will stick to a structure. And if you look at this, this is also on, um, I think this was on No Film School. They showed like a Parks and Rec, Parks and Recreation episode breakdown, and they show how it has three acts, but it also has three plots, A, B, and C plot. And you can see during Act One, <clears throat> obviously the main focus is the main plot or plot A, and that's the blue. And then in the plot B or the secondary plot, that's going to be in green. And then plot C or the tertiary plot is the little red thing. So it's not really as important. It doesn't take up as much screen time. And it shows how they do a cold open, three acts and a tag. And the acts usually last for about, give or take five minutes each, 
where the tag and the cold open lasts for about a minute to three minutes. And um, they broke down one episode, but I'm sure again, if you wanted to really do this, <clears throat> you could find a structure very similar to this throughout Parks and Rec for each episode where they have three plots, three act structure with a cold open that either goes with the story and leads up to it, or is just kind of a joke on its own and a tag that is showing the aftermath and showing like uh, how much of the A plot takes up the, the, the runtime, how much of the B plot and how much of the C plot takes it up. This stuff is uh, important to know, but with the plots, that might be different based on the episode and what you need to say in it. It doesn't have to be exactly the same every time and it doesn't have to appear in the same places, of course. But with the overall structure of everything, like how it's broken down into acts and things like that, that is very important. And that's why a showrunner is going to be leading it and they're going to have their own structure that everyone else is going to abide by because that will keep the stories consistent or the show consistent so that it feels the same and it feels like it's the same show. Does anyone have any questions, comments, or anything to add about TV sitcom formulas and structure or formatting if you're doing scripts? I like how you refer to um, the, the actual process as multicam. Um, a lot of people don't know or pay any, you know, when you hear multicam, you think, I mean, it is what it, you know, multiple cameras, but a lot of people confuse that um, with, you know, filmmaking on the filmmaking side. And, you know, you, there, you know, in big Hollywood, you'll see like two to three cameras sometimes. Well, a lot of times you'll see that, but that's not what, like the, the, the actual term multicam, because I, I get a lot of gigs where, oh, we're going to shoot this multicam. Like, you know, because, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. so like traditionally, you, you, you know, um, you want for filmmaking, you, would, you know, having maybe one or two cameras and then, you know, one or two cameras, one for a wider shot and another one for a closer shot, just, just, just to save time and the same, you know, the, the same light space and, the, you know, but for sitcoms, it's, it's different. They call it multicam because they're trying to cover as much because just like Priscilla said, the time frame is so much smaller. Um, so normally you'll hear the term multicam for um, sitcoms and, and shows and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. And you know, a lot of people get that confused. Yeah. And it's definitely like sitcoms are set up a lot more in the way of like a play because they're all from like the 180 degree line for the most part because the multicam is trying to capture everything at once. So they're, and they're very like flat lit so that everything is lit at once. So the cameras can capture it from all angles and it's gonna look good and it's gonna be consistent. And so yeah, multicam sitcoms are definitely set up way more in a way of theater. Whereas single cam sitcoms are set up more as short films or feature films. Does anyone else have any questions or anything to add? Um, not at the moment. I mean, I think it's it's interesting to learn more about like you know multicams and um, the three act kind of or like the three level structure because it's easy to write anything that's like surface level. But I really like the fact that they have the they actually have a like an actual structure mm -hmm. for it. Too. It's kind of cool and interesting. Yeah, just like diving in and adding on all the layers is kind of cool. It really is amazing to, to learn and see just how meticulous it is and how detailed and how impressive. For me, that was the main thing. I was like, I just found it was so impressive that, holy crap, they can fit all of this into this little amount of time. They can have, um, like, I remember, I don't remember which uh, video it was, but they actually timed multiple movies and showed, oh, normally this is around the mark where the first act ends this is around the mark where the second act ends same thing with tv shows and i was like that is so impressive on an editing standpoint on a writing standpoint that 
it must take so much work to structure it that perfectly and to still make a cohesive story and not feel like anything is it missing. I um, think it, it can be to the detriment of the story, though, um, as we've learned, like ne a lot of shows are like giving you more time. And, and I've also noticed that, um, for example, I'm what um, I was rewatching uh, Friends and I noticed on HBO Max that there's like I haven't watched it in years, but I could tell like there's parts missing. Like I could be like, wait a minute, it, it feels like there's a part missing. It feels like th there's a joke here that's, I remember, but it's not here. And then I looked it up, we looked it up and yeah, they, there were actually parts that they cut for time. Yeah, I because when it was brought stuff. to network um, originally, it had only 22 minutes or, you know, whatever the actual time slot was, it was around 22 minutes to fit it so they had to actually like shave off some jokes but in the dvd version or the blu-ray version they added those back in and for whatever reason hbo max has it with the what's called syndicated version which is even though they paid. own it yeah and that's I, I don't know why they have that instead of the dvd version but uh they have the syndicated version that's what it's called whenever they like shave it down for the network or for tv uh so on the platform they have it without some of the jokes there that you would see and if you watch the, it's kind of like an extended version of each episode in a way, but it's only like, and, and I would say it's only like a minute or two of jokes or different scenes, but it does add to each episode. But some are seamless and others, you can be like, whoa, it feels like they cut abruptly there. Like some, sometimes you can definitely see where they cut a joke and then I'll go back and check. And it's like, yep, that joke was, was there and it's not there anymore. And also you can tell that at the end credits, they will extend the episode through the credits. I used to think all shows did that. I was like, oh, and I used to wait around other shows to see, to wait, to see more of the show, but some of them would just end. And I was like, huh, I guess not all shows do that. And that's probably why too, for time. Yeah. Oh, sorry, sorry, you have your hand up? Um, yeah, I was just gonna, um, yeah, add in on on a comment about like it's difficult to like write, you know, have all the details and have it nuanced. Yeah, at first, anything's difficult at first, but once you do it like once or twice or three or five times, it actually becomes like you'll become the structure. Like the structure becomes like you spend the time meticulously to do it the first few times right. You just build off of that, and it actually it's like doesn't feel like it's a lot of work, even though it is, because it's just become a habit and ingrained. So those are the kinds of things to think about if you're looking at it and it looks daunting, or it looks like, oh, well, this is going to be a ton of work, or I don't know if I'm going to be able to pull it up. Yeah, at first it is, but then, you know, once you know how to do it, and you can do it consistently. I, mean, feel that I think so, too. Like, yes, I think once you have the structure, I think it depends, but I feel like that can help because, you know, all right, I have, you know, five pages to write this story point for act one and you can know like you have that many pages to do the setup and you can kind of cut out a lot of the stuff that doesn't need to be there and kind of any of the filler and all of that and kind of make it very concise and to the point um and so i feel like structure can be good and help with stories and writing once you get used to it like you said um whereas at first you have to figure out what the structure is going to be and then you have to fit your stories into that structure and it might be a lot harder at first, but just like Sarah said, I feel like it gets easier over time after you get used to doing it that way. The stories are just going to naturally flow in that order because you're already going to be used to that structure in your head. I agree to an extent because there's also the fact that like it's still hard in the in the point like yes, it gets easier as far as structure goes, but it's still hard because you have to cut things out of your story that you find important or that you'll find oh this would be such a good addition or oh I feel like this is crucial and that's where you run into those writers and directors that like their original cut is hours is like an hour longer or something because there's stuff that's so I think we can all agree for the cut. most part there's a lot of stuff that's kind of filler no yeah definitely extended definitely. extended extended versions like some definitely, of them are like yeah. you could cut this out I see why they cut this out I see why this is but a lot of the stuff, yeah, like a lot of stuff you can see that uh, was important or that 
I don't, like some of the stuff that's cut out is like, why did like, they cut this out? Why did they change I will this? Gripe it makes so much more sense this way. Scene. Yeah, I will forever complain about that Lord of the Rings scene in the extended edition that explains so much more about Saruman and all that kind of stuff. And I was like, why did they cut that? That is so important because I just remember the first time I watched it being like, so did he just disappear? I guess like we, we never touched on that. He's gone now. He's dead. Like that was such an important scene. And it, it I only saw it years later in the extended edition. Yeah. But, but for the rest of it, there's like definitely stuff that can be shaved down and be more concise yeah. to the point for, for the most part. Now there are always things that are going to be like, yeah, more often which is why that, also yes. streaming services with TV shows are, um, again, I think they're better for the creators because now they don't have that time constraint. If you go and look at a stream, a sitcom, or if you look at a television show on a streaming service and you look at the episode lengths, you can see that some of them are a few minutes longer. Some of them are a few minutes shorter and they don't, they're not all exactly to the exact point of um, you know, 22 minutes and 13 seconds exactly, or whatever, because they don't have Heck, to be. The new Stranger Things series is literally like multiple movies are an hour and a half long each episode of the new season. <laughs> yeah, well, that's because they have a huge budget. But I'm just meaning like, even if like you have a show that's like, you know, supposed to be an hour, it would take up an hour slot on television because of the commercials. So it's probably around 42 minutes long you can go on a streaming service and um if it's made for a streaming service they the episodes are like 45 minutes 49 minutes 36 minutes like they just have it very different because they either ran out of story or they had more story that needed to be told and so streaming services i think are making it easier for writers to be able to get their stories into those things without having to like cut it down to a very specific time slot like you would if you were on network or broadcast. But we're television. also, because of that, we're also not getting as much meticulousness with having, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Tight stories. Like they're not as tight as they used to. There's a lot of, oh, yeah. this could have been shaved out. Yeah. yeah. This didn't have to be this long. And that's, you know, a whole other issue. Right. All right, well, last thing I'm going to say is that Thursday we are going to be talking about world building with production design and creating a world, whether it is, um, well, we're mainly going to be talking about like creating your own world and like doing world building in the sense that you are creating an entire new place that doesn't exist. World building can also go into things that are, that do exist. You could world build into like a little neighborhood in New York and make up your own things and all this stuff of what is in that neighborhood. And that's come going to be some world building, but it's definitely not to the extent of like fantasy and sci-fi where you actually might create a whole new galaxy or a whole new world or planet uh, with different races and things like that. We'll talk about M and E tracks, what those mean and what they are. It's a distributable. It means music and effects track. And we'll talk about what that is. Character arcs in television and film, mainly television. Um, but we'll also talk about it with film and what a filler episode is and uh, what that means for a television show. All right. The last thing I'm going to say is that we still have our two exercises. They're going to be due June 30th, which is 10 days from now. That'll be next Thursday. Not this Thursday, but next Thursday. And we'll be going over them during the meeting. The first one is the um, picture or small clip that you do with color to set the tone, the mood, the style, or the emotion that you're trying to get across. Uh, so you do, you use color with production design. You can also use lighting and whatever else you want, but the main focus is color and making the colors help to uh, portray that emotion or that style that you're going for. And then the second one is to create either a mood board or a lookbook for an idea you have, or to create an I just come up with an idea out of your head uh, for this exercise to get references and things, or do research if you're doing a time period thing 
and make a mood board either on like Pinterest or gomoodboard.com. Those are two that are free that you can use for free. If you use the one on the, the computer anyway, I don't know about the apps, but um, that way you can kind of get your idea down and you can kind of see it visually and you can see the visual elements that need to be go into it. So those are our two exercises do next Thursday. <clears throat> Thanks everybody for being here. I hope you guys all have a good few days and hopefully see you guys all Thursday. Sounds good. See you then. Bye guys. Bye guys. Good night, everybody. Good night. Good night.